Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it will all get settled down if you can. And uh, not to say we haven't got everybody yet, but uh, we'll try. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, again, formally. We now declare this meeting open. Um, Caroline, would you like to go through the set fire safety regulations, please? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, if the fire alarm sounds, if you could leave by the nearest available exit, please, there's one in that corner and one behind me here, and then congregate in the car park by the barrier. Thank you very much. I'd just like to draw people's attention and make quite sure that they've got their mobile phones turned off or onto silent. And, and also, would uh, uh, members of the public and members and, and officers here make quite sure you've got the uh, microphone switched on uh, when you're talking and, and switched off when you're not? I'm probably guilty of making mistakes in this area, but let's try and do it, and if you can do it properly. Uh, just recently, or since our last committee meeting, we've had some very sad news about a former, a former councillor uh, who was very prominent on this, particularly, this particular committee, and that's councillor Mike Louse. I, I can't tell you how long Mike has been a councillor for, but I, I suspect it's in the region of 30 to 40 years and he was very much part of the establishment here. And uh, he was one of those people who really subscribed to the old feeling of serving his community and, and that he did for a huge amount of time. Uh, I served with him when he was vice chair of this committee uh, between I think nine, 2014 and 2019. And he was very active and he's been very active as a county councillor, a city councillor, and a member of almost every other organization in this district. So it, with your consent, I'd like to stand for a minute and think in quite, very quietly about Councillor Mike Louse. And finally, before we, we get on to the proper agenda, I would like to say that Mike has been honoured with a, a Thanksgiving and memorial service in Ely Cathedral, and that will be taking place at 2.30 on Tuesday, the 21st of June. Um, and I think that's really appropriate that the city is honouring one of its most significant citizens. Anyway, I now move on to... Uh, item number one, uh, which is apologies and substitutions. We have apologies from Councillor Lavinia Edwards and Councillor Liz Every, and we have Councillor Julia Huffer here as a substitute for Councillor Every. Thank you. And members, do I have any declarations of interest? No, that's that's none. You've all read the uh, minutes of the last meeting and the one so on the 4th of May and the 19th of May. Uh, and is there any reason, members, why I should not later sign these minutes as being a true record of those two meetings? 
No. Okay. Uh, we now move on to item number four. And uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate Cassie Patterson, who was a uh, planning assistant with us and has now met the necessary requirements and been promoted to uh, a, a full-on planning officer. So congratulations and, uh, and, and a welcome. Um, we also have Adil Eunice, who has joined us in the corner, uh, <laughs> hiding away. He's a legal assistant and he started only yesterday. So uh, he doesn't know all the uh, problems he's got coming to him <laughs> at the moment, uh, but, but welcome. <laughs> Now we move on to item number five, and it's down to the officer's presentation, and that's Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just before I embark on the presentation, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to a few matters that um, were raised um, on our site visit earlier today. Um, members have been, attention has been drawn um, to the committee update sheet regarding the, the Murphic group now have no further involvement in the um, agenda item five. Um, and the receivers have recently been appointed. Um, the function of the receiver is to realize the property secured by the charge and bring about repayment of the debt secured by it. The receiver ideally needs to secure the reserve matters approval and then will decide what to do with the site. This matter will have no bearing on the application under consideration as the application will run with the land and not with the ownership. So just, it's just worth clarifying that. Um, another issue that was brought up at the site visit was the, um, the um, affordable housing um, provision or the percentage of affordable housing. Now this was dealt with in great detail in the outline application and the um, applicants um, applied for building um, vacant building credit. And this is um, a, a government uh, initiative um, to promote development on Brownfield site, and it applies to any building that has not been abandoned and is brought back into any lawful use or is demolished to be replaced by a new building. In this instance, there were six existing properties on the site, and as 22 dwellings um, were proposed with a deduction of four dwellings, as we were advised that two were capable of being kept in residential use, um, this would mean that the affordable requirement on 18 dwellings would be five affordable units on the site. So that's how we've got to that stage, okay, for clarification purposes. Right, now let's get back into the presentation. Um, this is a reserve matters application dealing with um, the issues of uh, appearance, landscaping, layout, scale, um, relating to the previously approved outline scheme, which dealt with access only. This is the site plan edged in red. You can see little green abuts the eastern boundary um, with the commercial development just to the top of the red line to the north. And then Hobbs Warren, which is a recent um, development of um, I think it's eight properties to the south. And here we go again. Sorry, it's a bit of a squiggly line because I've drawn that myself, but um, that would just sort of <laughs> gives you an idea of where it is because it's quite an overgrown site. Um, you'll notice here the, the home office, there's a a note here, and that's the existing dwelling. Um, let's see, oh, here we go, that's, that's still there. So that's retained and that's actually occupied. Um, and the access you can see is, um, is, re oh, well, is retained through there. Okay, next slide is the surroundings. It's still quite overgrown. So this, um, on the left-hand side, you're looking into the site from Little Green, and then you're looking back out uh, again towards Little Green on the right-hand side. Um, and this is Little Green now. You see that there's a footpath that was part of the application for Hobbs Warren, which has been um, in created on um, Little Green now. You can see that there's quite dense foliage on the, on the border of the site, and that's going to be retained because most of that's outside of the, ba um, the boundary. Um, here we have the, the old bungalows. As you can see, they're quite dilapidated. Um, the ecology report recommended that uh, a bat survey be undertaken, um, so I'll, I'll deal with that later, but it just gives you an idea of um, how overgrown it is. Okay, so the proposal is the residential development of up to 22 houses following the demolition of six bungalows comprising four five-bedroom houses, six four-bedroom houses, 
five three bedrooms, five two bedrooms, two of which are bungalows and two one bedroom properties. The material planning considerations are the principle of development, housing mix and layout, residential amenity, visual amenity, highways and parking, ecology and biodiversity, flooding and drainage. So the principle of development has been established at outline and no issues have been identified such that the principle of development is no longer um, acceptable. So here we have the new layout. Um, it's not significantly altered from the outline application as approved. The number of bungalows has been reduced to two, um, but the scheme still includes a good mix of one, two, three, four, and five bedroom properties. Um, so the residential amenity of existing neighbors, as I've mentioned that you've got number, said number one, but it's number seven, is the existing building. And you can see that's grayed out. Let's see if this works now. Oh yeah, there it is, that's the existing, that's the existing, entrance that's still being retained and then you've got the, the development around that the uh, the scheme was amended um, to to um, su support the residential amenity of the existing neighbor um, by the introduction of a bungalow just below the um, built the existing building and then you've got on the sort of on the left hand side of the existing number seven you've got um, like a garage and quite a significant gap so you know there's no overlooking or detriment to to those uh, those neighbors here we go so the future residential amenity um, again we had concerns about the the tree line as you can see on the um, to the right of the the writing um, and the you know, the ability of these trees to overshadow existing um, proposed um, occupiers. So again, the, uh, the scheme was amended to ensure that there was adequate sunlight, daylight penetration to warm habitable rooms. So visual amenity, again, um, I've just uh, done something that I find quite, uh, quite clever. Um, you see a red line on the left-hand side by the aerial photo, and that represents the street scene, which is laid out below. So you see that Hobbs Warren is the development here. There. And then you've got this line here, which is represented on that row of housing that's going to front Little Green now. So you've got the commercial development on the on to the top, to the north of the site, Hobbs Warren on the to, to, to the south, and therefore it integrates quite well with those two developments. Okay, so I'll just run through because that was flagged up in the letters of representation. There wasn't a, an adequate mix of housing and the, the design was poor. So I'll just run through some of the housing designs. Um, you've got house type one, um, which is uh, five beds. Um, house type two, four beds. House type three, you've got four beds again. House type four, three beds. House type five, three beds again. And then house type six is the affordable housing, which is a combination of uh, a masonette. So you've got one bedroom flats on the ground and first floors, and then two bedroomed um, terraced development. And then the bungalows, which are two beds as well. So from highway and safety um, perspective, the outline application dealt with access. Um, and the highways um, authority, well, it's an existing access anyway, so there were no um, concerns raised by the local um, planning or local highways authority. They, they were mindful that the internal layout could not be adoptable, um, but they've, the applicants have indicated a swept path analysis, which you can see there on the, the slide, um, that indicates that vehicles are able to um, service the site and, and um, egress the site in a forward gear. Adequate allocated and allocate and unallocated parking has been provided. Um, and uh, conditions have been placed on the consent that um, relate to um, further details being provided of road and footways, as well as future management and maintenance of the internal road layout. So ecology and biodiversity, the site is to be, is being considered of low relative ecological and nature conservation value at outline stage. A bat presence assessment report concluded there was no evidence of bats using the buildings. 
a number of trees removed and a replacement scheme has been proposed. As public open space is to be delivered off site, a 10% net gain for the site could not be achieved, but further details of the biodiversity improvements um, are going to be submitted by condition on that's on the outline as well. Okay, here comes the drainage. Now this was quite a significant issue and this is the reason why it's been called into committee by Councillor Sharp is that there were concerns uh, about the existing amount of um, flooding on Little Green. Now in this, this is a schematic of the drainage. So you've got the blue shaded areas. Do you want me to point with my pointer or can you make them out? Okay. So you've got these little blue shaded areas. They're the permeable paving. Okay. And then the blue dotted line, I've got to think now, um, is the channel drain. And that ties into the um, dark blue line, which is the attenuation tank. So in the outline scheme, there was going to be an attenuation basin. Um, but in this reserve matter scheme, it's now going to be a tank. Um, and therefore, they're going to use the existing um, channel of that was used at the on the existing development, which will channel it. And this is where I'll show you with my dotted line. So the scheme will drain into the attenuation tank here, and then once that, if that overflows, that will be channeled by this route to the existing drainage channel on the other side of Little Green. Um, so other matters, the sustainable and energy efficiency of the site, um, sufficient information has been submitted with the application because that was a condition of the, um, of the outline, uh, which has been accepted by the building control and this meets the requirements of condition number 18 of the outline planning consent. So the conclusion, the presumption in favour of sustainable development, principle of development was considered acceptable at outline stage and therefore the reserve matters is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Caroline is going to read aloud a statement from Alicia Taylor. So away you go. As a resident of Cheveley and neighbour of the Home Office Bungalows site, I object to the last three iterations of the plans for its development for the following reasons. Number one, the road in front of the development frequently floods and as recently as 5th of March 2022. Flooding occurs on Oak Lane, both outside the Chelton site and at Hobbs Warren, which are located to each side of the proposed development. This road is treacherous in poor weather conditions and the proposed high density housing will increase surface runoff, exacerbating this issue and causing a serious hazard for local residents. This will certainly be felt severely by residents of nearby Hobbs Warren, for whom the pavement is frequently impassable during the winter, impeding access to local services such as the school. The deep road flooding makes vehicular access difficult and dangerous. Access to the Chelton site is also compromised. The proposed minor changes to the drainage layout will have little impact on reducing runoff to an overloaded water system that is insufficient to deal with the current drainage needs. The sheer density of housing combined with the lack of open spaces and surface drainage ponds and ditches is too much for an area which frequently floods prior to any further development. Number two, the development still does not have an appropriate mix of housing types. The original proposition had six bungalows and the latest plans only switch out two of the three bed homes for bungalows and retains the larger houses which were added as an amendment to the original approved plans. This will do little to ensure a balance of demographic groups in this new community. Number three, the density of housing which imp will impact the concentration of traffic on the local narrow country lanes which are already heavily used by cars, tractors, horse boxes and indeed pedestrians due to the lack of pavements along Oak Lane. Number four, the proposed high density housing with shifted emphasis towards large four and five bedroom family homes will overburden the oversubscribed village school. Thank you for considering my objections in your decision regarding the revisions made to this planning application. Thank you. 
Thank you, Caroline. Uh, we've now got Adam Tuck, accompanied by Anthony Kintish, uh, who we would be delighted to hear from. Uh, I believe Mr. Kintish is here to answer questions if members have any, and Mr. Tuck is going to make the presentation. You've got five minutes and the amber light will come on at four. Uh, thank you, Chair and members. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the officer for a well-reasoned report and for the constructive and collaborative dialogue during the application process. Um, this reserve matters application was submitted and validated on the 16th of July last year, and we've worked very closely with the officer throughout the process to address comments and concerns raised. This has involved reducing the scale of some of the properties, more specifically to include the provision of two bungalows closest to the neighbouring residential dwelling, all homes have been designed to offer flexible lifetime accommodation. The overall layout remains generally in accordance with the approved outline permission and alterations have been made to some elements following comments from the case officer and from highways, such as the parking layout associated with the affordable housing. Um, the landscaping has also been amended and enhanced following comments from the tree officer. The outline permission established the principle of 22 dwellings on this site and was approved with a drainage strategy to mitigate against any flood risk and drainage issues. We are aware of the local concerns raised regarding uh, the drainage and flooding. This reserve matters application and associated detailed drainage strategy demonstrates to the satisfaction of the lead local flood authority that the development does not increase the risk of surface water flooding. Uh, in fact, we'd argue that there would be a, a net drainage benefit because rainwater is captured and flows will be managed for all storm events through the combined use of permeable paving, restricted outfalls into the sewer network and additional attenuation through the cellular, cellular tank. Flows will be discharged at a very low rate into the existing network in accordance with national policy and as approved by the LL, LLFA. This system will be maintained by a management company. Uh, this development will provide 22 attractive high quality and a mix of family homes, including five smaller one and two bed affordable homes for local people. Concerns raised by the parish council over the materials to be used remain subject to the control of the local authority for the, through the proposed materials condition. Uh, and we support the officer recommendation for approval. I'm here today with Anthony Kintish, who's now acting as receiver. Uh, and we're happy to answer any questions that members might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, members? Well, oh, thank you, Councillor Trapp. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, one thing I do note, it is quite high density. Also, the five bedroom houses seem to only have two parking places, which uh, five bedrooms probably equates to three or four cars. Um, so that's going to have a problem. And there's not much space there for parking elsewhere. Um, the other thing I do note on your plans is that the for the affordable housing, there's parking bays associated with them. But now that we are really seriously talking about electric vehicles, we ought to be putting in charging points or provision of electricity, electrical power points there for charging points to be put in associated with each house, because that is the best way, most efficient way of actually charging electric vehicles at night when it's cheap and at its own charging place, not at a public one. So how are we going to deal, deal with that? Um, well, firstly, on the five beds, I mean, everything there has been designed in accordance with the parking standards in the adopted plan. The five beds also include those double garages and there's five visitor spaces on the proposal as well. Um, regarding the affordable units, we have got an affordable housing provider on board, um, who's a best not name, but we've got a local registered provider who's interested in taking the units. Um, I'm all for electric vehicle charging points, but whether they're gonna be delivered for the affordable units will to some extent be determined by the affordable housing provider. Um, I can't see any reason subject to local capacity in the grid that the full market houses can't have a, a, an electric charging point, but the affordable units to some extent are out of our control once they're handed over to the affordable housing provider. 
surely that should be a condition that we have, that it seems very socially divisive that those open market houses can have par par um, electric charging and the social housing or uh, affordable housing will not. No, I completely agree. I mean, we'd surely and that must be a provision that we ought to have. I know other authorities have a condition regarding uh, car charging points. I think um, there's, Bill, there's, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. There's there's no reason why we can't have the provision. We can have conduits from the properties to the to an individual parking space. There's no problem with doing that's, that. That's that's what we should be having. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a, a comment to the planning manager. Have has that now been confirmed as being offered as or be included as a condition? If members wish to include it as a condition, then that can form part of your recommendation. It's not a condition that we've put on purely because we don't have a policy that says you must have it. It's only within the Fordham neighborhood plan. That's a, a settlement where we do request it because there's a specific uh, policy within their neighborhood plan. Um, so if members wanted to add it, it's not something we've recommended as officers, but it could be something if members felt that that was, they needed that to be included as part of your recommendation, we could get a scheme to be submitted. Thank you. Thank you. And we have. That's all right. Yes, please, please come in. Um, can you just clarify what you were saying about the, the charging points? So what you're saying is the charging points won't be attached to the house, but they will be actually allocated within the parking base so that anybody within the affordable houses could use them, which would be a much more satisfactory idea. I was suggesting that. Uh, each affordable unit is allocated a space and yes. the there could be a conduit from the property to the space to then pull yes. a cable through so yeah. that they could then charge their car yeah, yeah. once I, they decide whichever provider they want to. yeah that's fine as long as i think i agree with councillor trapp that this needs to be a, a condition any more questions members nope okay we have thank you very much indeed uh, we have Councillor Alan Sharp, who is the ward member uh, for this area. I think you know the system, Councillor Sharp. Mic on. Um, hurdle. Um, yes, thanks for considering the comments and thanks for Anne for the report. I mean, we have spoken about this um, site. I think it's fair to say the village is in broad agreement with the, um, the site. Um, it's included in the emerging neighbourhood plan, so there's no argument about the principle of development. I think the original outline application had a much better balanced number of homes with more smaller homes that would enable families to remain in the village rather than move away. So, so I'm disappointed with the number of bigger ones. Um, however, there, there does seem to be a current trend of developers gaining outline permission and then changing the layout totally, but that's obviously the world we live in. Um, my concerns came about after the original landowner got the outline permission with little, and as I say, with little or no issues from the village. But it was then sold to a developer who I have had experience with um, in the past. Um, it was the same developer who um, built eight properties in Borough Green, which is another part of my ward and has left a, a trail of work, poor workmanship, underground drains not properly connected, shoddy workmanship and basically um, incorrect building positions of properties and basically refusing to do anything. And that is still ongoing. That developer, um, and this is public knowledge, is there are alleged 43 counts of falsifying building control documents, um, both in Newmarket at the site and the Borough Green site um, by Ipswich, um, by Suffolk Trading Standards. And he's already had an initial court hearing in November last year at Ipswich Crown Court, and it's due to be heard next year. That's when my alarm bells went up as a, as a ward member, because when I saw the fact that the drainage was gonna be underground, my immediate thoughts was about pipes not connected and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the current proposal, as, as Anne says, has the um, collecting pools below the permeable surface, 
um, with the final collecting pond at the junction of the site with Little Green, which then morphs into Oak Lane. The print proposal is for the pipes to go under the road and end in a private ditch opposite, which is owned by one of the studs. I had a, an on-site meeting yesterday with two um, of the flood, team, flood risk and sustainable drainage teams from county. Um, and I think it's fair to say that they have certain concerns about this. One is whether highways will actually adopt it and take the responsibility in. I noticed what um, the speakers earlier were saying, it was gonna be managed by, maintained by a management company. So presumably that will be funded by residents, which might alleviate that situation, but obviously um, not totally. The area is very susceptible to, flooding especially after the it seems after the Hobbs Warren development it seems to have got a lot lot worse there are eight houses on that and that's about 200 yards away the roads completely flooded after any large rainfall and the epicenter appears to be close to the entrance to the proposed site um, this may be because of the contour of the area I know you've been out there today if you look at that little green it does go up and down quite a bit and and, and it may just be that ironic um, that it, that it falls there. Um, highways are going to do some work on digging out the highways ditch, which is on the development side of Hope Lane. The ditch on the other side, which is much deeper, is owned by the stud, as I understand it, and put some grips on the other side. But the problem with the grips there, be, through to the narrowness of the road, large agricultural vehicles and large, there are a lot of large studs around there, large um, horse boxes. When they meet, they have to go onto the verges to get past, and it's just wearing them down. Um, and also there's only one double gully along that part of the road as well. Um, as I say, I met on site yesterday and they're totally aware of the issues around the site and that we face in this part of Cheveley um, because residents have suffered a lot with, with the, the flooding. They, they are certainly both prepared to get a workable and sustainable drainage solution, which would need to be agreed, as I understand it, with conditions if the reserve masses was agreed today. And they certainly agreed to meet with me on site and the future developer once the receivers um, sold the, the site off. So if you're in minded to reprove it today, um, then I would ask that some conditions around that we make sure that we're, we're very happy with the flood and the drainage situation before we approve. Um, but, but to finally finish, as I say, some of my concerns are taken away because the fact that the original developer is now in receivership and that was one of my leading concerns. Thank you, I think I've hit the five minutes. Thank you, perfect timing. Um, members, questions? Thank you. Not at all, I'm very happy to oblige. Um, this, I mean, is just the end of interest, I suppose, is, um, is the developer in in, in, in um, is bankrupt because of all the litigation against him. Is that a way of avoiding the litigation? Um, I, I, I'm not not aware for certain, but um, yes, I, I think the development in Newmarket, he must have lost a lot of money on, but that's you know, hearsay, uh, not necessarily a public comment. Um, but we, we, I, are not privy we, we are debating a planning application, yeah. not a, not a yeah. financial status no. of a previous... Uh, previously specified developer. But can I ask a follow-up question? I mean, it seems to me that there's a problem with the drainage and affecting the, the correct drainage and making sure that a road which seems to suffer from drainage issues, surface water, is maintained. Does it not like exacerbated by more development here? That, that's really my concern, Councillor Trapp, is that um, I, I've it's probably one of the key issues in my county ward and the local highways officer is very aware of this. And as I say, that they, they, they are going to do some work. I'm not sure when, but it will be relatively soon. And the danger was if we've got the runoff from, as you probably saw when you went out today, the contour of the land does run down naturally. So the water is going to run down. Um, if um, yeah, we, we, we've got to get the drainage solution sorted that make, but we didn't want it exacerbated by any further development prior, prior to that being sorted, um, if that makes sense. Because at the moment it's all almost green field and it's all soaked into the ground. 
Isn't on the it? left hand side, as you look at it from the road, on the left hand side of the, there's a lot of green fields. There is a fair bit of concrete tile. If you walk up to it and then turn right, and then you turn left, you come to number seven, which yeah. was referred to um, by Anne earlier on in the presentation. Um, but yes, there's, the, there's concrete runoff. So we, we would get some water runoff even now down into it, which may be causing part of the problem. If, if we, if as the um, developers proposing permeable surface, that actually may make it may may make it better. Yes. Um, but obviously, I'm not an I'm not an expert on that. But that that getting rid of the concrete may actually improve it. I don't know whether. Thanks, Ralph. Any other questions from members? No. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for your time, Chairman. Have we got any um, comments from the officer? Just basically that the League Local Flood Authority have no longer objected. I think the, uh, the request to put your mouth near the microphone applies. Oh, sorry. Sorry. And just that the, the League Local Flood Authority no longer have an objection. They've removed their holding objection because um, additional information has been submitted. Um, and you've got condition 14 of the outline consent, which is a belt and braces condition providing a sustainable urban drainage strategy for the site. So again, unfortunately, you're gonna to have to amend that condition because it refers to the previous drainage strategy for the site. But, um, you know, we do have checks and balances to ensure that, um, you know, the, the drainage and flooding would not be an issue from that site. No, that's it. You're complete. Members, uh, any questions to the officer? Uh, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Anne. And you mentioned in your presentation that uh, biodiversity improvements would be uh, done by condition. But is it lost somewhere in condition one in all the uh, drawings and documents? Because if not, I can't see it in the other conditions. There was one in the um, uh, outline consent. Um, I can find right, it for you. Uh, yeah. Just, just for future then. If the, condition if 13. The con if, if the conditions in outline yeah, there's a condition consent, 13. Could, they be, could they be sent with the agenda papers? Yeah, we can do that in future, at least then you yeah. can cross-reference and see. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm under, if you could just give me a bit of help with understanding some of the numbers. So with the affordable uh, housing allocation, uh, it's five because that's 30% of 18, which is the number we're dealing with, not 22, because there's an offset for them using a brownfield site. Can you explain that in a bit more detail, sorry? Okay, so um, the NPPF 2019, um, paragraph 63 states that to support the reuse of brownfield land where vacant buildings are being reused for redevelopment, any affordable housing contribution should be reduced by a proportionate amount. So that's, that's what the, the applicant supplied for the vacant building credit. And we did our sums and they did their sums. Um, with the complete agreement with the housing um, housing officer here, um, and agreed that five houses, affordable houses, would be um, the proportionate number on this site. Sorry, and so you're saying that because it's in the NPPF uh, and they've got the credit, there's essentially nothing we can do about that at the local level if we wanted that to be higher. I could not question government policy, no. Councillor Trapp. Thank you. Um, and I, I didn't, wasn't quite sure what you said right at the beginning about houses being abandoned. Can you take me through that again? There was something about... Yeah, um, ultimately the, the site possessed six, um, six dwellings which um, were, so let me get this right. So there was, uh, in this instance, there were six existing properties on this site, okay? 
um, with a deduction of four dwellings, because two were capable of being reused, you know, um, to be reinstated as an, you know, as a proper dwelling. So, um, so they're being kept, that, so that was capable of being kept in residential use. So therefore, the, the affordable requirement would have been 18 dwellings, not the affordable, on, the affordable requirement on 18 dwellings would be five affordable units. I thought, having looked at those houses, none were actually in a state to be reinstated. Yeah, but, but you've got to think that this has gone back quite a few years. I think the, the negotiations asbestos started in 2018. Roofing. Sorry? Asbestos roofing, it seems. I'm sorry, I couldn't Asbestos. Hear Wasn't it asbestos roofing? Yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. Um, the other one thing you mentioned was a footpath. Is there a footpath from, from this estate to the post office nearby? The, the footpath from the site is, is, going, is included in the conditions on the outline consent. So there'll be a footpath connecting to the footpath that's there now that was, re, you know, was instated by the Hobbs Warren development. So there will be a continuous footpath now through, I think you can walk all the way to the, well, I've walked all the way through um, uh, Little Green myself. Okay. Thank you very much. Footpath. Rebecca. Oh, I was just going to interject in terms of the affordable housing to say all of that was dealt with the outline and it was all secured in the 106. So it's not anything we can start debating or discussing today because that was all secured at the outline stage. And today we're just principally looking at the design and, and the layout. And that's all I just wanted to advise members. Okay, members, we now go on to, uh, to oh, yeah, Councillor Hopper. Well, I was about to start it. <laughs> I think you, you may have been a, a millisecond too late or a millisecond early, I don't know which. We are now going into the debate section, and I think Councillor Huffer is the first one to speak. Um, I, I thought this was a large site. I think it is a not unpleasing um, layout. I think it does everything that it needs to do. I have to say I would contradict the lady who wrote in to complain about the mix of housing. I think it's quite a good mix of housing. I would have liked to have seen the affordable housing units scattered about, but I understand the reasoning why they're not. Um, I fully get that. So um, I'm quite happy to go along with the um, officer's recommendations and I'm quite happy to propose, should anybody choose to second. Yes, actually, I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy personally. We'll continue a debate to second that. Uh, but I would be trying to include something uh, that talks about electrical charging points. Yeah, um, can, and, and also, I would, is it possible to condition back boxes? I don't know, is, is that a possibility? There's, there's the biodiversity um, condition, mm. so that proposes mitigation, um, and that's a condition of the outline which would need to be discharged. But we, we haven't seen that. That's well, no, that was, that was because that, was, that yeah. was with the outline application. Yeah, but did that so include bat boxes? That includes bird everything, boxes, yeah. Things, yeah. Swift boxes. And yeah, and things. that will be con that will be considered by the planning officer when that is um, submitted. Yeah, because it is, you know... Can, can I just point out that the normal etiquette is that the... Questions and answers go through the chair, as opposed to what's called chit chat. Uh, we now have Councillor Brown. It's all right, Chair, you beat me to it. I was going to second. Councillor Downey. Oh, lovely, thank you. Um, I'm not opposed to building on this site in general, and I think. Uh, I, I don't think we could anyway, because we've obviously already approved it out, uh, outline and indeed approved the mix of affordable. Uh, what I would like to talk about with regards to affordable housing um, is that particularly with the uh, overall increase in scale in the market housing, um, we're looking at if you go from 22, the number in the, the whole number in the application, 11.3% by my calculation, if somebody wants to correct me, I'm fine with that, but 11.3% of the actual bedrooms are affordable. And obviously our policy actually deals with whole number of dwellings rather than a uh, proportion of bedrooms. But I think it is particularly, I think it's a bit galling when we've had an application come in and outline where the market mix has been 
has been a smaller number of bedrooms, the average size has overall been a little bit smaller, to then increase it at this stage. And essentially, it's going to be just to rack up some profits, which I can understand from a profit making company, that's how the world works, but it, it is galling and it leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure how I'll vote because that's annoying though I accept there's not a lot we can do about it um but I'm glad that there'll be at least the inclusion of conditions uh to uh ensure that the affordable housings get charging points that will certainly please me members more debate councillor trap um I, the, the, the charging point is is actually uh, important thing, and I was, I'm quite happy to propose if should one need a proposal for that to be included as a condition. I think, I think it's fairly covered now. Your 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 participation would be to either support or, or vote against it. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, um, I, like like um, Councillor Downey, I am concerned about the number of. Um, in increase of the number of beds. And I think that's maybe when we discuss the local plan in the future, we ought to be thinking about this, that actually affordable housing is just as important for those who need three or four bedrooms as it is for just one or two bedrooms. We mustn't be actually stinking and saying, oh God, affordable housing, got to, got to reduce it to something small. So I think it is something to do with our policies. We ought to, ought to be thinking about that. And I, I do deplore that I'm actually increasing the number of five bedroom houses here. I think this is once again just what I call Oliver Twist. Every time the outline uh, plan and permission comes out, it's oh gosh, yes, only three houses only. Oh no, suddenly we get six at the reserve matter stage. And I think we ought to be more self circumspect and more wary about this inflation that occurs because otherwise we are going to be producing things which are perhaps to the detriment of our residents. So that's it. Councillor Ambrose Smith. Thank you. Carrying on with the affordable housing, I presume that some advice was sought by housing providers as to the size of properties that were most required in the area? Yes, the housing officer was on board when we were discussing this application and she's she's agreed with the mix of accommodation. We're, we're actually in the debate stage. We've, we've gone through the, the questions to officer. So anyway, you've had your answer, Councillor Ambrosio. So any other questions? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Now I'll just echo the thoughts of my fellow members here, really. Um, I'm in support of this, so I'll be working with it, I'm sure, um, as most of us are here. Um, so, yes, I think it's a fairly good scheme overall. I'm happy with it. Any more? No? Well, we, ha we have a proposal from Councillor Huffer, uh, which is seconded by me, and I, we need a, a, a bit of advice from the planning manager in... It is the discussion has been so far, but it would like to be conditioned that all the houses were connected for electrical charging. Normally, what we've done on other schemes and to treat it and be consistent with others is we put a condition on to ask for a strategy to be submitted in terms of charging points, because it could be that there's an issue with a parking space, for example, getting a charging point. So to say that all of them must have them, I don't consider to be reasonable. And what we've done across the board with other ones that have come before members is we've asked for a condition requiring a strategy to come forward, which is then submitted to officers to assess. So it's going to come forward and officers are going to decide the fine detail of it. Yeah, that is and, what we've done across the board. And so that would be then, that is a proposal that, uh, if it is your proposal, Councillor Huffer, is that the, I'm absolutely fine with that, Chair, as long as we can provision that the, the affordable houses, the affordable housing units get the, the same level of attention or the same access to electrical charging points as everybody else. We can make a note on the file so it's on there, so that it's there, so when the strategy is submitted, then that, that can be reviewed and assessed. Councillor Trapp. Yes, I mean, I think it's what Mr Kintage said, 
that having a, a conduit from a parking place to the house is what is required. So at, at, least, at least one that's a, for each for each dwelling. So what we're suggesting is that we put a condition on for a, a strategy, which is yeah. what we've done as this committee's done with every other application, uh, and then that strategy would be submitted and the officer would then have to assess that. Okay, so I think we've we've got that resolved. So we have a proposal from Councillor Huffer, seconded by me. I think most members are clear of what this entails, and that is accepting um, accepting the application, but with the caveats about electrical charging that we have discussed. But those people in favour of that, those members in favour of that, please raise their hands. Will those people against please raise their hands? Will those people abstaining please raise their hands? That's eight votes in favour, no votes against, and two abstentions. So that is carried and, and the uh, application is approved. Gentlemen associated with this application, if you want to leave now, you're more than welcome to. Okay, we now move on to agenda item six. Tony. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to get myself organised. So, item six, uh, Maraway Lane, Witchford. So, a little bit of housekeeping, um, which I believe have already been sent, which are the comments from the LLFA and comments from Witchwood Parish Council. Um, in essence, there is no objection from the Lead Local Flood Authority and obviously um, Witchwood Parish Council maintain their objection with regard to the location of the cycleway. So this is the site. Um, as you can see, the site is located to the south of the A142 and to the north of Maraway Lane and is adjacent to the development of Bovis Homes to the east. And this is an aerial view of the site. There are some trees to the north that are covered by a tree preservation order, however this was, is already dealt with. Um, there's an award ditch which runs along the southern boundary. And again, you can see the A142 to the north. So the proposal is for the reserve matters for the demolition of dilapidated farm buildings, an erection of 40 dwellings, ancillary infrastructure, public open space and drainage infrastructure. And this, the principle of development was approved in, under the outline 18007780. So in terms of the proposal, there are 40 dwellings. 100% um, is affordable housing and the section 106 will be dealt with in terms of um, changing that to the 100%. It provides four one-bed properties, 16 two-bed properties, 18 three-bed properties and two four-bed properties. There are 80 car parking spaces with the cycle path to the north and retention of the permissive path and a ward ditch to the south. With, and a bund with acoustic fencing to the A142. So I'm just going to sort of give you a brief overview of the, of the dwellings and what they look like. So as you can see, they are all semi-detached. So this is, um, we have three bedroom properties on here and two bedroom properties. We have a mix of three and four, four bed properties on this. And again, you can see that the, the design is carried through. Plots 37 to 40 are maisonettes. So these are one bed properties. We have plots 21, 22, 31 and 32. And these again are two bed properties. 
plots one and two. So as you enter the site, um, these are three bed properties. And now we're looking at photographs of the site. So the, the photograph just here is taken from the permissive path that's there at the moment. And you can see the award ditch along here. This photograph is taken from looking from where we stood today, looking across to the Bovis site. This photograph here is looking more towards um, the back of the properties on Granter Close. And then the bottom photograph is of looking across the site. So what are the main considerations? Principle of development, residential amenity, noise, visual amenity, highway safety, and the cycle footpath. So in terms of the principle of development, the principle of 40 dwellings on this site was set out in the approval for the outline. And it is also allocated within the Witchford Neighbourhood Plan under policy WFDH1B. So the principle of development, the site is 2.2 hectares and this equates to 18 dwellings per hectare. In old money, it's 5.4 acres with eight dwellings per acre. If you compare this with the adjoining development, so Granter Close and Wheats Close, this equates to approximately 15 dwellings, dwellings per hectare or six dwellings per acre. And the current development on Wesley Way equates to 41 dwellings per hectare or 17 dwellings per acre. So the density is in keeping with the character of the area and it makes an efficient use of land. In terms of the residential amenity, it meets the standards of the design guide adopted by the local authority. There is no overlooking. Gardens are in excess of 50 square meters, 538 square feet, and conditions can be placed restricting any additional windows and obscure glazing to ensure that I mean, um, the amenities of the adjoining neighbours are maintained for the future. So this would comply with the design guide SVD, EMV1 and EMV2. Noise. Now there is a band and fencing and the, the development or well, the application was supported by a noise, noise impact assessment. And this was accepted by the environmental health officer. Four dwellings would exceed. However, it was considered that it, it wasn't to, to cause harm to the detriment and there were ways that it could be dealt with. Um, there is a Kemp and a and working hours restricted on the outline. So it's considered that the proposal can comply with EMV1, EMV2 and EVEN9. In terms of visual amenity, so this is um, just looking across the site, some street scenes that were provided by the agent. So you, you've got a broad view. You can see there's different materials and there's different heights and there's slightly different designs. You can see that it's all comprehensive and comes together. So in terms of visual amenity, mix of design, mix of heights, mix of materials, but is also simple. So it is considered to comply with EMV1 to the design guide, LC1, H1 and H3. In terms of highway safety, there's adequate parking spaces. There are 80 spaces across the site. The access is acceptable and no objections have been raised from the local authority. And on this basis complies with COM7 and COM8. So the sticking point really is the cycle and footpath. Policy requires that there's a requirement to set aside land for the delivery of an east west, uh, west east pedestrian and cycle spine through, through from Marilane to Common Road through the southern part of the site. However, it has been provided to the north, lighting and surfaced with a permissive path to the south. Myself as an officer and with, uh, with um, Rebecca had a meeting with the agent and it was discussed in detail. And it was this way forward was came through as a compromise. So to the south of the site, we know that there is an award ditch. An award ditch, are, we have 27 miles of them within our district. And the local authority is um, required to desilt these dish it, ditches. And what they take out of these ditches, they leave to the side because it then ensures that there's a habitat for the wildlife. And this is carried out sort of at, after September to avoid harming birds and invertebrates. So it's, it's a way of protecting the environment. In discussion with um, 
the parks and recreation officer who, who actually deals with this, it was considered that having the cycle path in the south, south of the site, not only would it be a greater cost, it would also increase the carbon footprint. The arisings from the desilting have to be spread adjacent to where the ditch is. And in doing so, this would then block the cycle path. There needs to be a certain amount of space for maintenance and lighting the cycleway, which would be required, would actually have a detrimental impact on the biodiversity of the area. There were also concerns about health and safety, having a cycle path adjacent to a ditch. So sort of to give you an idea, we have the proposed cycle path here, which actually links up with the cycle path on the adjoining development of the Bovis homes and the award ditch runs along here. So what is being proposed is that the cycle path will run to the north, connecting with the adjacent site and along the award ditch, there would be, it would be left. So it could still be walked upon. And as we found ourselves today, it was quite dry. You could have walked along that boundary. Policy WFDH1B of the neighbourhood plan, it, the proposal meets all of the other parts of the policy. It's just that the cycleway to the south cannot be delivered because it would lead to a reduction in biodiversity. And this would be contrary to policies EMV7 of the local plan and GI3 of the neighbourhood plan. The south also fails to link with the cycleway on the adjacent site, which would be contrary to policy T1 of the Richford neighbourhood plan because the, the, the connectivity would be less. So as, a, as an officer, we have to, to, to make a balance and it's considered that providing the south cycleway would lead to the proposal being contra contrary to policies EMV7, GI3 and T1. And this provides a compromise where you get a cycleway to the north and a permissive path to the south. So in conclusion, a cycle and a footpath can be provided. It provides 100% affordable housing, highway safety can be maintained as well as neighboring amenities and the future amenities of the occupiers of the dwellings. And on this basis is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for spelling out the, the obvious pluses and minuses with this this particular application. We now have um, uh, the applicant's agent, Jake Sten Steniford. You've got five minutes and uh, an amber light will come on at four. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. I'm Jake Stentiford. I'm the agent for the application. Um, I just want to speak briefly because your officer's report is very robust and we fully endorse the findings and the positive recommendation. Uh, since this application was submitted last year, we've worked extensively with your planning officers to make amendments to satisfy all technical consultees uh, and to ensure that the scheme achieves a high standard of design uh, and makes a positive contribution to the character of the area. Uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, with the extensive open space and landscaping that we're providing, uh, which will surround the site's contribution to the West East pedestrian uh, and cycle spine route through the village. This area will form a really attractive uh, recreation, amenity and biodiversity feature that can be enjoyed by the whole community. Uh, the application has been called into planning committee uh, because of an objection from the parish council. Uh, a few months ago, uh, as Tony mentioned, I, I met with officers uh, and with the parish council's representative uh, to see if we could resolve their concerns. Um, it seemed at the time uh, that the proposals in general were acceptable, uh, but the parish council wanted to ensure that a route uh, would be preserved along the southern boundary um, for maintenance and informal use. Um, we agreed on a suitable amendment, uh, as you've seen, and that is now reflected uh, in the proposed plans. Um, it's unfortunate that, uh, that following this, the parish council again objected, but we're still very happy um, to provide the amendment that, that we agreed on. Uh, this scheme achieves an excellent standard of design and it will make a great contribution to the village. Uh, most of all, I'm very pleased uh, that we're able to bring this forward as a fully affordable development. Um, we're very keen to start work immediately uh, and get on with providing these affordable homes uh, for local people and families who need them now. Uh, so I'd be very grateful for your support today. Thank you. Thank you. Have we any... Uh, um questions. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
all the houses are affordable, but how many are uh, for rent and how many are shared ownership? At the moment, we don't have uh, a tenure breakdown, which forms part of the application. Um, I'm conscious that it's something that could be conditioned, uh, but the registered provider who's accent homes uh, generally bring forward a balanced mix, and we always ensure the different tenures are mixed throughout the site to ensure that we get a nice integrated community. Um, uh, it, on, on top of that, it would always be worked out with the housing officers of the council as well to make sure that the exact local needs are being, being met. So can I follow that up by saying they won't all be shared ownership then? No, absolutely not, no. Councillor Trapp first and then Councillor Ambrose Smith. Thank you very much. It's very pleasing to note or to see that you have four bedroom houses for affordability compared to the previous uh, application. Um, that's great. And three bedroom houses as well. Both are very much in needed. Um, one question I had, I had two questions actually. One is a follow on from Councillor Wilson about affordable housing. Will that be affordable in perpetuity? i.e. that the uh, authority, the persons who's looking after this will be keeping a share of that, the, the um, house, and only 60% or something else will be sold to the uh, purchaser. And therefore the same condition will apply on, on release. Is that true? Yes, in relation to those units which come forward as shared ownership. Uh, there'll also be some affordable rent throughout the site, which would remain in the ownership of the registered provider. Thank you. And the other question I have is about the maintenance of the award ditch. Is there enough space, do you think, between the, f the first corner is the one that seems to be most problematic for getting the equipment done? Is that going to be a problem or not? Are we, are we, is, it, is it a condition that we could have that that it would it would be down to East Cambridge District Council to maintain the award ditch. So this is something that we've worked on and, and Spencer Clark, um, a Parks Open Spaces Manager, has reviewed and, and said he's happy with what's been proposed. Thank you. Christine Ambo Smith. Thank you. Hello. Um, number of parking spaces. I know that <coughs> I know that <coughs> excuse me. I know that um, uh, the number given equates to two per property, bearing in mind that increasingly <clears throat> many of us have um, deliveries by all sorts of organisations now. Um, do you feel that you have got sufficient space for someone who's having a grocery delivery or something that you know, the delivery van can park up and do that, which might take several minutes. Other smaller deliveries, it might be only a couple of minutes while someone runs in and out. Another consideration is many of these uh, homes may be occupied by families who have white van uh, occupations. So in say a three bed house, it's quite possible that there's two family cars plus works van or something do you are you fairly confident that these number of vehicles can be um, accommodated without having constant parking on the roads yes first of all the scheme is policy compliant in terms of the parking provision but it's also a scheme which has been developed very closely with the registered provider who are accent homes and they uh, maintain the site as a whole operate the site and they operate many sites uh, so they're very familiar with the kind of issues that can arise due to uh, uh, due to parking provision so we're very confident that they are happy with it um, if, they, if, if they thought it would lead to a problem we would have addressed that in the design uh, so we're quite confident that, it, um, that the parking provision is is adequate in terms of deliveries in general uh, we've taken care to um, provide the vehicle tracking for uh, delivery vehicles up to a larger size than the, the, the sort of standard Amazon van that is usually used. Um, uh, so, so we've ensured that the site um, in terms of turning and manoeuvring is um, uh, uh, fully acceptable for, for future proofed really for those deliveries. Good afternoon. 
<laughs> Sorry. Hello. Um, a couple of questions. Um, the with yourselves, when you put together the plan, was it in consultation with the Witchford neighbourhood plan? Did you you look at that and see what their sort of suggestions were for this scheme? Yes, yes, we looked at the uh, looked at the neighbourhood plan policy, and as you've heard um, from mm -hmm. the presentation, the scheme is compliant fully with the, with the policy. Uh, with the one exception of the of the particular route through the site okay. of the pedestrian. So that's my first question. So the second one, um, with regard to your initial proposal, was for the um, cycle path to be at the north, and then we heard much about the meeting that you had with the planning officer um, and to just discuss a compromise. And then I, I looked at um, which was parish council's minutes when they discussed this item. Um, they had concerns that there might be a cost that may not be met by somebody. So when you had the meeting and you came to a compromise, has this given you extra costs to actually have a compromise that gives sort of a couple of different options? I think the compromise that we reached was to provide an additional informal route along the southern boundary yeah um, it slightly reduced some of the garden sizes that's what we did in order to take the scheme off mm -hmm. uh, off that boundary um, but it, it's a it will be an informal path similar to what it what it is now okay. uh, so it not, doesn't have a significant cost on the development okay lovely thank you very much Councillor Trapp I think you probably heard my comments of previous application about electrical charging points I noted that uh, two of the houses have their parking not adjacent to the house. Will you be also providing a conduit for electrical connections to the, from the house to one of the parking places? What we would normally do in those circumstances is provide, yes, a, a, a charging point which is at the uh, you know, on the parking spaces, whether that serves both of them or want to serve each yes i don't think we have a condition on this application which secures electric vehicle um provision unless correct me if i'm wrong Tony. but it's it, we are very accustomed to get getting conditions like that normally we'd be yeah. making that provision anyway and we'd be very happy to accept a condition for electric vehicle charging strategy thank you very much um the other thing is there's sort of two laybys on the north side of the road are those for visitor parking yes so there's only four spaces really for visitors. Well, the policy compliant level of provision has, has been made with visitor parking, but uh, as I mentioned, it also reflects um, the registered providers experience in, in what their requirement is for a site. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd just like to make it quite clear. I, as you know, was, I attended that meeting uh, which took place in this building. The chairman of Whitford Parish Council didn't commit the Parish Council. He made it quite clear that he was sort of listening to what was being said uh, and he would go back and, and get the opinion of his Parish Council. So I don't want there to be any confusion that the chairman committed Whitford Parish Council. He didn't. Uh, so that's just clarity for the record. And, Thanks, Jay. Uh, I appreciate that. Anybody else? Yes, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, just for clarity, because I get the feeling we're going to come into this issue of the um, the, uh, the the routes by the um, uh, uh, the ward um, uh, ditch. Um, how heavily did you consider running a path along there? Did it was it due to just um, size of plots and things like that that it, it got in? Did did any serious plans come about looking at it? And is it just because it would reduce the number of properties on the bits or? No, it's not because it would reduce the number of plots at all. It's it, it's impractical and, and, and undeliverable for, for quite a large number of reasons. Uh, the planning office has gone through some of those which relate to the impact that it would have on the award ditch uh, and uh, the issues that would create around maintenance. It also doesn't link properly to the cycle, the, the rest of the spine route, which terminates at the northeast part of the site. So in that sense, um, the northern route that we have is, is more effective to deliver the objective of the neighbourhood plan policy, if you like, rather, although not, not meeting the actual word of the policy. Um, 
uh, we also have um, issues with noise on the site. It's had to be considered very carefully in terms of the positioning of dwellings to keep them out of the, the contours of noise, uh, road noise, um, and to shift the scheme northward to provide sufficient space to provide the hard surface, the lighting and so on, uh, in order to route the pedestrian cycles fine route there, would push dwellings into the uh, into those those noise contours as well. So there's a number of reasons why it would be not to, it would be harmful to other policy objectives which would be prioritised. Um, just for clarity, I mean, I can obviously ask the officer um, along the informal the permissive route. Is there a connection at the other end? Because there seemed to be a bit of a pathway, but it didn't know if it did actually link up to it. Um, that one there. So you've got the trees. Is there a route onto the path connecting those two? Um. Sorry, so there's a footpath here that goes down into Autumn Close. All right. And then the, it wasn't there when I was on site, but um, I understand from Andrew's last site visit, and he went to the Bovis site. Um, there is now a footpath here, but that links up in the two. Oh, it links up that way. I didn't know if it went across to the other one. That's what I just thought. Yeah. No, there's no footpath that goes along no, no, here. No direct footpath that way. Thank you. Okay, I think that's, thank you. And uh, we, we now have the chairman of uh, Richard Parish Council, Councillor Boylet. You've got five minutes, Councillor, and uh, Orange Light will go on at four. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you to the Planning Committee for listening to us. Uh, Witchford Parish Council considered the Planning Officer's report recommending approval of the application at its council meeting on the 1st of June. The Parish Council has consistently objected to this application on the ground that it is not compliant with the Witchford Neighbourhood Plan. The Neighbourhood Plan was supported by Witchford residents in a referendum in March 2020, when it was approved by a majority of 572 votes to 25. The neighbourhood plan was adopted by East Cam's Council on 21st of May 2020 and is legally part of the development plan for East Cambridge Road, and is required to be referred to by East Cam's when determining planning applications. Richard Kay, East Cam's District Council's Strategic Planning Manager, has confirmed that the District Council treats the neighbourhood plan as part of the East Cambridge Development Plan. Parish Council notes that the planning officer is mainly relying on the objections raised by the Parks and Open Spaces Officer at East Cams when reaching the decision to recommend approval. These objections are the cost to provide suitable service uh, to enable heavy plant to access and work from the path, the need to spread the watercourse arisings from the desilting, de de the maintenance of the watercourse and that East Cairns District Council not wishing to adopt a path in this location, and I quote, which is therefore likely to go to a management company which rarely work after a few years. The Parish Council is concerned that these comments are outweighing the statutory status of the neighbourhood plan. Cost is not a planning consideration. The Parish Council also notes that at the Manor Road development site, which is covered by policy WFDH2 in the neighbourhood plan, a similar requirement to provide a cycle way has been incorporated by the site developer without it raising any objection or query. This demonstrates that the requirement to provide the cycle way is not onerous on the developer. The Parish Council also notes that at present, the developer is not providing any infrastructure, for example, a local play area to benefit the community. The Parish Council has a policy and a project to provide a cycleway through Witchford along the route, the Southern route, as set in the neighborhood plan, right through to Witchford Village College. The, the Manor Road development site is providing that link, and it is also running directly beside the drain, the drain ditch. Uh, if it can run beside that drain ditch, why can't it run beside this drain ditch? The, 
Parish Council notes also that the Witchford neighbourhood plan was made prior to the first reserve matters application being made by the developer. It therefore contends that the neighbourhood policy has been available throughout the reserve matters application process and should have been taken into account by the developer in the site layout and design. The parish council has no objection to the development of the site it only seeking compliance with the neighbourhood plan. The Parish Council asked the Planning Commission to uphold the neighbourhood plan and its policies and to refuse the application. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. Councillor Huffer, Jones. Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, you spoke about a footpath. I, I, I don't know if I misheard. But what you're saying is then what you, the blue, the pale blue line, <laughs> the award ditch line, you're saying that the developer, the Bovis developer, has put another footpath as well as the purple line, which is the, the line that we're proposing it connects to, that the Bovis developer has put another footpath along the back alongside the ditch. Is that what you're saying? It hasn't actually installed it at the moment, but the parish council, as part of its policy on the cycle plan through the site, through Witchford, is in discussions with the Bovis developer on acquiring that land to produce that part of the cycleway. It would then join up with the other development site that I mentioned. So, so is that, I, I don't know if this is a question for you or for the planning officer, the, how far along does that award ditch go? Because the same issues of biodiversity, light pollution, and everything else that would affect the award ditch, award ditch, if you're in negotiations with Bovis as well to do the same thing, we're going to have exactly the same issue there. I don't know whether or not, I don't know what the legal, legal ramifications of that are. I don't know whether or not this is a... All I was going to say was obviously I would advise that you also having discussions with Spencer Clark because it goes adjacent to the award ditch. So at the minute, nothing's we haven't approved a, a footpath that's going along that section as far as I'm aware. So you may be in discussions with Bovis, but it's whether actually that could be implemented because obviously we need to be able to still main, maintain that award ditch. However, you have through reserve matters on the other side, agreed the cycleway that runs alongside the ditch, which is the continuation of the ditch as it runs through the site, as it runs through Richford, opposite the school. Uh, yeah, the Common Road, Man Road application has got a cycleway that goes against a ditch. That ditch was a filled drainage ditch drainage ditch so it's not the same and part of that ditch was being re infilled to create the cycleway and change footpath roads so it's not the same relation to this awarded ditch so uh redevelopment redevelopment says this one which uh we'll call number one then it goes into what was the bow scheme number two which is the award draining goes down there you then had another event between Common Road and Manor Road next to the school. That's a third development, which has a field ditch, so not an awarded ditch, that runs along uh, Manor Road section. And that was a different set of circumstances, but that did provide a footpath on the su southern lane, but that was not against the awarded ditch. So, so to, sorry, I'm not sure who I'm asking this question to at this point. So that the purple line, the yellow line, the idea is that the yellow line, purple line, then joins up with the third cycle path. Uh, that purple line will then go back down through the Bovis scheme to build end, and then we'll go to, along the roads and then- To join up with the path that this gentleman is talking yeah, about. Yeah, which go, crosses common roads, and then they get into another cycle link, which goes to school. But, but not along the award ditch. Uh, no part of that purple line goes along the award ditch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we, if we can try and keep... Yeah, Jones. Yes. Uh, if, if we can keep the, uh, the conversation through the chair, I understand. 
I know it was you wanted to get to the bottom of it. I appreciate that. Uh, so, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I had very similar questions to Councillor Huffer. Um, can I just, uh, if I may, it's sort of in two parts on this one. I mean, officers, um, obviously, we've, you, you've talked about the neighbourhood plan and you wanting um, uh, the, um, it, it's outlined in the plan, uh, neighbourhood plan. Do you feel the neighbourhood plans, well, I appreciate they need to be descript uh, prescriptive in terms of what they do in order to get developers to comply to them. Um, do you not think they really just set out a spirit of what's involved in about like connecting cycle routes up and things like that and giving a coherent overall policy to it? Or do you think they need to be prescriptive because you've said it at this point, come what may, we need to stick to the plan? I think there's a mixture. Uh, certain, certain policies will be descriptive and if you like, uh, sacrosanct, if I've used that word, whereas some others are uh, aspirations. Uh, and in the neighbourhood plan, it talks about cycle routes and things like that and pro uh, promoting ecological travel, etc. And these are aspirations for the neighbourhood plan and which for the parish council, whereas some items are distinct requirements or the parish council sees them as distinct requirements. And this uh, terms, if you like, that were put onto this site, the parish council sees as, in a way, sacrosanct. For me, Chair, just to, think, uh, just to clarify. Um, so from our point of view, we're asked to put on this and you obviously want to consider that cycle route, particularly sacrosanct, even though they're often, seem to be offering an alternative, which according to the officers and things like that seem to link up better to it. If we were to take your route, would you as a council prefer a, a plan that lost more social housing? Um, because in order to accommodate this particular um, aspect that you are quite clearly persistent on, on wanting, um, it would inquire, you know, a good uh, uh, space between development um, and the cycleway, which would lose a, a large proportion of the housing there. Is that what you feel would be a better solution for this particular site? And why we... The Barish Council in its discussions believed that the site could still accommodate the 40 properties and the cycleway at the southern route. Okay, Councillor Stubbs. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, Councillor Rowan. Um, I've got a number of questions. So just initially, this site was brought forward as part of the local plan recommended for inclusion by Witchford. That's correct. The site in principle. Correct. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So, um, and Witchford Parish Council, you have a working party that's a climate change sort of group focuses on those sort of issues, is that right? Yeah, so when the discussions were taking place around reserve matters, and I think it's because I know this is the thing I'm sort of struggling with at the moment, there's three things that are really important for that group and which would overall will be the biodiversity, um, the affordable housing, the cycle pass, all of those things really, really important to climate change. So from what I heard from the developer, not everything could be satisfied. So with the, the climate change, what was their view on the impact on biodiversity on the award ditch that we've heard today? Because obviously that, you know, the, it's the way it's been maintained as it, I think was explained, when they silt everything, it's got to be left on the side for the habitat. So what, were, what was their sort of view on that? The Climate Change Group have representation at the Parish Council and they were in support of the Parish Council stand. So that, what did that, what does that actually mean? What does that mean? They're in support, so in support of, not maintain the, the ditch or what sort of, what do you mean? They, they believe, they supported the decision 
to object on the grounds of not meeting the requirement to provide a southern route for the cycle path, uh, and they supported that. Okay. On the on the balance, if um, you like. On the balance, okay. Yeah. And one final question, if I may. Um, when the neighbor which would neighborhood plan was being considered, and you may not may not know, because I know Councillor Allen was very um, pivotal at this. Was the award ditch being considered when it was agreed to um, propose that the cycle path be in the southern part of the actual um, scheme? Certainly the parish council was aware that that award ditch was where it was mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, the recommended or the recommendation requirement for the cycle path on the southern route would run beside that ditch. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Trapp. I'm afraid I've got very similar questions. I was aware, were the um, council aware? I, I, what, you've answered that one, I think, about, about the, the award ditch and the fact that having an award ditch there really, actually, as impl implied by the, or said by the planning officer, required a few metres of land by it before one could have a cycle track. So if one had a cycle track there, one would still have the ward ditch, one would have about a few meters, I'm not showing how much for spreading the silted up person on the side, which has the problem, then the uh, bicycle. What, I mean, how much was the um, neighborhood plan people aware of this need? And following up from this, if, that the whole thing is moved, and which should be moved about eight meters, as we said, it would mean that the houses now are much closer to the A142, which is quite noisy when I was there. I don't know whether that would make it less noisy moving 